Got some youth workers in the house out here. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Father, we thank you for what we've just experienced in this house. And we thank you, Lord God, for how worship got whipped up in this place. We thank you for how you were we were taken into your presence, God. And we thank you for the mission that's at hand. Thank you, God, for the transformation that's on the horizon. Thank you, God, for the revolution that's in the midst, God. And we ask you now to continue to bless what you're doing in this place, God. Empower and equip us, God. Continue to have your way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been called to do something for God that seemed impossible? Let, let me ask you again. Have you ever been called to do something for God that seemed impossible? You got fired up doing a hot worship service like the one we just got out of. I, I, I thought, now, they should not do that prior to preaching because... I thought I'm really going to have to come back to earth to participate in this with you because I was really for about a good 15 minutes transcendent. Uh, <laughs> so my brothers, Dios te bendiga. Gracias. Hallelujah. But you got worked up, fired up in a revival. You came to a conference like this and you got impassioned and something in you said, I'll do it. I want to give my life. I want to commit my life. You, you, you had a meaningful time with God. I don't know where, a quiet time perhaps. And you just felt the overwhelming presence of God and you felt called in a way that you've never felt called before. And in that moment of excitement and exuberance and in that season of, of high energy, you said, yes, Lord. I want to do it. I want to go. Send me. That's exactly what happened to Isaiah in chapter 6. Why don't you turn to that book with me? Isaiah chapter 6. I'm going to read. I've been living in Isaiah for the last six or seven months now. And I'm still there. And I want to pick up the latter part of that chapter, Isaiah chapter 6. And for a scripture this morning, we're going to read the 8th through the 13th verse. Here's what God's word says. You ready? Ready. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Hear and hear, but do not understand. See and see, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people fat and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts. And turned and be and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste, without inhabitant, and houses without men, and the land is utterly desolate, and the Lord removes men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again. Like the t terebinth or an oak whose stump remains standing when it is felled, the holy seed is its stump. Part of me wants to say, what? What? Let's see if we can understand the word of God. Isaiah got caught up in a hot worship service. Glory to the Lord filled the temple. House got all filled with smoke, stuff started shaking all over the place, and he was having church, high church in the highest. He lifted his hands and worshiped God. He saw God exalted high and lifted up. He saw angels singing holy. He saw God in an exalted state. He experienced the very glory of God. Worship was in, it, 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 it just absolutely overwhelming. Worship was ecstatic. Worship was like nothing he had ever experienced before. Worship was life changing. Worship caused himself to see himself. And for the first time, perhaps, in Isaiah's life, he came face to face with all of him. 
Worship was life changing and I, I pray God let me settle into this thing and share from my spirit with you because I want to tell you that that's what worship is supposed to be. These brothers didn't take us into the throne room of God for nothing. They didn't work this hard and give that much and pour out to that extent for us to have had a good time. Something transcendent is supposed to happen when somebody goes that deep into the holy things of God. Oh, I ain't gonna get no help, but that's all right. <laughs> when somebody goes deep into the things of God and pulls out treasures from the spirit realm and revelation starts flying and, and walls start coming down and, and stuff gets broken up and you start to see yourself differently. That's what worship is supposed to do. Oh, Good God Almighty, that's what worship is supposed to do. Worship is supposed to change your life. True worship is supposed to transform you and I. Worship is to be changed. We've not worshiped if we've not changed. So, so, so Isaiah in the house with God exalted and lifted up and worship magnifying the presence of God. Nobody had an altar call. Nobody said, yo man, you need to clean up your act. Isaiah said all by himself. I feel a preach coming up. That's your fault. <laughs> Isaiah said, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. Nobody said you got a dirty mouth because God was exalted, because God was lifted up, because true worship took place. The man of God said, I ain't all I thought I was. <laughs> I ain't as good as I thought I was. I don't have it all together like I thought I did. I look pretty good when I compared myself to you. But when I start comparing myself to God, when I see myself in the presence of the awesomeness of God, it makes me back up a little bit. Makes me check myself. Makes me take inventory of myself. And I come up short. Woe is me. I'm messed up. I got a dirty mouth. Ah, this unclean lips thing, what's that all about? Somewhere in the word of God, I believe it says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I believe what Isaiah was saying is I recognize that my mouth is a reflection of my heart. Ah, God, I need you to purify my heart. I'm messed up. I'm, I'm dirty on the inside and I can tell by my confessions. I can tell by the words I speak. I can tell by the stuff that comes out my mouth. Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. Do you see that he not only saw his own sin, but he had a critique of his people? A, a, a real worship will make you see yourself different and it'll cause you to recognize the generation around you. It'll make you say, you know what, God? I'm a product of my generation. The truth is I talk this way because everybody around me talks this way. I, I think like this because I've been socialized to think like this. So he repents. He acknowledges his sin and immediately God cleanses him. Immediately God forgives him. Immediately God comes with fire. Parenthetically speaking, let me say to you that the fire ain't always bad. <laughs> Last night we were reminded that every now and then a youth worker will find him or herself in the yeah, and sometimes it ain't just the devil and you just can't rebuke it. Every now and then it's a God-ordained fire. <laughs> every now and then God will whip up a little purifying fire. God's got a way of getting his people all fixed up and cleaned up and... Oh. <laughs> So, so God sent the fire from the altar. I know when fire comes into my life, I want to rebuke it. The devil is a liar. <laughs> you know that I rebuke it. But every now and then, some of the suffering that comes into our lives, some of the rough places, some of the, the hard stuff, some of it's ordained by God. We've been lied to, people, to believe that everything that hurts ain't God. 
We've been lied to to come to the conclusion that if we ain't happy all the time and if we got to go through something that somehow other God ain't in it, the old folk used to know that it was a pressing way. Somebody ought to get in a press. I never really understood Paul, but I'm starting to understand this thing about rejoicing in my suffering because suffering worketh patience and patience worketh endurance. Hey, and endurance produces character and character produces hope and that hope will not disappoint us. Oh, that was just a parenthetical, parenthetical thing. I'm, I'm back, I'm back. But I, I just felt like somebody needs to know that what you're going through ain't all bad. What you're going through, if you just switch your perspective for a minute and start rejoicing in it, shout a little bit in the fire, get your dance on in the fire, and let God purify your heart. It's working on your character, my sister. I'm talking to somebody in here. I don't know who you are, but he's working on you. He's working on you. Sometimes he sends fire from the altar. Ah. And now that he's been purified, now that God sent the fire to Isaiah's life, now that he's acknowledged where he sees himself, he's ready for his assignment. And so now the question comes, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Isaiah said, well, look, I ain't much, but I mean, look, I just confessed that I wasn't everything and my mouth is dirty and I know my heart is dirty. And, and so God, look, I, I don't know if you can use me, but here am I, send me. And so God said, your mission, should you choose to accept it? <laughs> Go say to this people, keep hearing but don't understand. Keep seeing but never develop perception. Isaiah's assignment, his mission was to make the people's heart fat. His job was to feed them the word of God, to give them such an intense diet of the word, the purpose, the will of God in the earth. Knowing that they would never do it. I don't like preaching the folk bar that I know ain't going to do it. <laughs> I don't like pouring out my soul and pouring out my guts. I don't like singing to that extent and going into that depth of worship when I don't think folks are going to go nowhere. I'm not preaching for entertainment. I'm preaching for conviction. I'm preaching for transformation. I'm looking... I'm looking for a revolution up in here. So it bothers me when I pour my soul out, when I labor over the word of God, when I lay my face on the floor before God and the folk won't do right. What kind of an assignment is this, Isaiah, that you're going to go preach to folk that you know are going to be hearers of the word and not doers also? Hearers only refuse to be doers of the word. What kind of assignment is this to go preach to folk and prophesy to folk that you know aren't going to live it? Who wants that job? That's mission. That's what I'm trying to say. That's what I'm trying to say. That's what I'm trying to say. That's mission impossible. But I want you to know that I believe that we, in this room, in this generation, we are also called to what seems like an impossible mission in this generation. Let me tell you some facts that are just plain true. By the year 2050, some think in the next 25 years, there will be more non-white than white Americans. And most of those people will be Latino and Asian, not black. Let me say it again, because I'm not sure. Let me let it, we're going to let it sink in. In the next 25 years, there are going to be more non-white than white Americans living in this country. And most of those people are going to be Latino and Asian 
not black. Therefore, aprendiendo, I blah español. Yeah, I am. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> the world is changing. Demographic realities are encroaching upon us and life is not going to be the way we grew up. It's not going to look the way it looked. Church is going to be different. The methodologies we use in youth ministry is going to change. Our curriculum is going to be different. The pictures we use are going to be different. The language we employ is going to be different. Things are going to be different. But not many people are getting ready for it. Oh no, oh no, oh no, we're not. We're creatures of habit. We like the things we like. We love church the way we know church. That's why if somebody like this came to a black church, we couldn't get with it too good because we couldn't, we couldn't get a shout on with it. Even though, honey, I tell you, <laughs> we are used to what we're used to and certain things wig us out when it goes too far outside of the box for us. Am I right? For the first time, the ramifications of these demographic shifts is that for the first time, white people are going to be a minority in the United States. Do you know that that is absolutely terrifying people? Folks are scared all over this country. People are scared. The last election we just came through is evidence of the polarization and the fear that is rampant and endemic in our society. People are afraid of the changes that are coming. Folks are starting to pull their stuff in. We're getting a little bit more selfish. We're not wanting to support ministries and, and we're looking for ways to hide our taxes and save our money. We're not as generous of a people. I know I'm right. Because when you get scared that opportunity is going to be taken away from you and somebody's going to get my thing, then we start pop passing proposition this and proposition that and oh, I know I'm right. And we start, oh, we start trying to make sure that we limit access and keep them from coming across the border and send them back on them same ships they came on. And We're scared. We're scared, but my children, I've got two, a five-year-old and an 11-year-old, and they play games all the time, and one of those games are hide-and-go-seek, and we all know that at some point, you count for a while, you count for a while, and then you announce to the people who are hiding, ready or not, here I come, and that's what diversity is going to do with us. It's going to announce at some point, you can be ready if you want to, you can prepare for this if you choose to, but ready or not, here I come. So as these changes come upon us, what I have experienced across the country, what I know you are seeing in the cities that you work in, what we're reading in the newspaper is that the level of suspicion and hostility and fear is on the rise. Folks are going postal out there. Folks are saying, good, honest Americans, hardworking folks are saying, Annie, get your gun. Get your gun, baby. Get your <laughs> Start packing. They're not going to come take our stuff. Do you know that when asked at the end of his ministry what he saw as the most pressing issue facing the world in the 21st century, Reverend Dr. Billy Graham said this, racial and ethnic hostility is the foremost, the foremost social problem facing our world today. From the systematic horror of ethnic cleansing in Bosnia to the random violence ravaging our inner cities, our world seems caught up in a tidal wave of racial and ethnic tension. This hostility threatens the very foundations of modern society. You and your kids, the kids you work with, the kids you're leading to Christ, you and your kids are going to be faced with more racial and ethnic diversity than any generation that has ever preceded you. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, 
is to proclaim the kingdom of God to a world that doesn't think it's possible. You see, my Bible tells me that diversity ain't no problem for God. Now, I don't know if you're in the same book with me, but way back in the book of Revelation, and somebody said that what people do when they want to tell you where they're going, if you can go to the back of the book, you know, if you want to see how the story's going to end, if you just are wondering if the good guys are going to win and what the conclusion of the matter's going to be, then you can cheat and just skip on up through Acts and make your way quick through Galatians and go on past Hebrews 1st and 2nd Timothy and go on into past 1st, 2nd and 3rd John. Get on through Jude and find your way to Revelations. And if you turn to the back of the book in chapter 7, verse 9, he said, I ain't confused by all of this. I'm doing this. I'm up to this. I'm bringing all my family together. I'm bringing the Latino people. I'm bringing the Asian people. I'm bringing the Native American people. I'm bringing the black people I'm bringing the European people I'm all up into this thing I'm bringing folk from Africa I'm looking in Brazil for somebody I'm bringing my people together that's what I'm doing you ought not be alarmed and you shouldn't be caught unaware ah don't you know what I'm doing in the earth don't you know what I'm up to around here I'm causing my kingdom to come I'm making myself an army made up of a multitude of folk you can't even count you can't number them they're made up of every nation every Every tribe, every people group, every language. My God, my God. Hey, and they're all going to be standing before God, praising God a little bit like this. Huh? Glory out of yours. Ah, bless your name, Jesus. Ooh, glory, glory, glory. Somebody else in another language over here. Somebody going to say, Buana. I say, Fiwe. I say, oh, you just better praise him because that's what God is doing. Now the question is, will we get our kids ready for what God is doing? Or will we get our kids ready for what God is doing? Or will they be caught unaware? Because when folks see God moving sometimes, they need somebody like a youth worker to interpret a God thing. You might see it and say, oh, there's too many of them Mexicans coming. There's too many Filipinos coming. There's too many, they in our group. And you're supposed to say, yeah, they in our group. I'm glad they in our group. That's a part of our group. I want them in the group. This is a God thing. I want to contend to you that that's where God is going. I, 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 I'm not trying to be judgmental. God, hold me back from criticism. But if discipleship is following Jesus, and if following Jesus means going to where he is going, and if he says that he is going toward a multi-ethnic kingdom, does it stand to reason that anybody who's not going toward a multi-ethnic kingdom ain't following him? Now, I, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just trying to work with it, but it would appear that if he going this way and you ain't going that way, You know, something make you go. I just thought I'd put it out there. <laughs> oh, God. Our, our mission is to recruit and cultivate some kingdom people. Ah, but let me warn you in advance, before you get too fired up in here with me, people don't believe it's possible. Before you go out and try to hook up your group and, and tell them about this God thing, do you know that most of the young people that we work with don't even believe that what we're talking about is possible, that the kingdom of God is possible? We read these verses and that's a wish dream. They can't even conceive of a kingdom made up of a place where folk don't fight each other and races don't contend with each other and folk get along. Let me let you hear a quote that I read that just help me tremendously put language to how young people feel. It's a young girl and she wrote an article called Talking to Generation X and this is what she says. We can't even imagine a world of cultural or national unity. Our world is more like a tattered patchwork quilt. We have every inconsequential thing, Nintendo 64s, 
and home pages and cell phones, but not one important thing to believe in. So my brothers and my sisters, your mission is to go out and make some kingdom converts out of people who can't even imagine that it's possible, out of people who are scared of diversity, out of people who are more married to their church than to the kingdom. You, 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 you are called to make kingdom people out of folks who would prefer to stay isolated and insulated in their own little worlds. Ain't nobody trying to speak no other language. I know I'm right. As I travel and meet people, I want you to know, and again, I love America, I love you, and so I'm just here to give what God gave me to give to you. But Americans are people who speak the fewest languages in the, in the world. If you meet somebody from China, folk can speak four and five languages. Most of us, many of us who are in the city can't speak two. I'm going to leave that alone. I heard it, but I ain't going to mess with it. <laughs> she said they can't speak English, but... But do you hear what I'm saying? And it suggests that we have gotten so used to the world that revolves around Americans, around us. So when we go to other countries, we say stuff like, where McDonald's? I don't like this food. Well, you know, we look for stuff like us, but if the statistics I read to you are true, the world is changing and no longer are we the center of folks existence. Amen? Amen. And just like folks have had to learn about us, we may have to learn about them. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. We may need to take us a little trip out of the country every now and then, and we may want to teach our kids how to learn other languages. And do you know, maybe that's part of what God is doing, that it's time for us to learn from each other, as opposed to saying, I don't understand the words. Brother, can you translate that for me? Because I want to roll with it. I want to get with it. Help me to know what that means. Teach me to sing in another language. Help me get ready for the kingdom of God. It is such a difficult thing to try to convert apart people who don't want to hear. It's such a hard thing to try to help folk change when they want to stay the same. And that's why Isaiah said, how long? Now that I know the mission, <laughs> I done signed up now, Jesus. I done said, here am I, sent me. So now the only thing I can say is, how long? How long do you want me to do this? How long do you want me to keep beating my head up against a wall trying to preach something folk don't want to hear? How long do you want me to try to convert folk to a kingdom when they're trying to stay stuck to the world? How long? How long? And God said, until there's nothing left but a stump, Ah, he said the holy seed is its stump. I want you to preach and preach. I want you to prophesy, tell the truth, stand up for what I'm saying, open up your mouth and declare my purposes in the earth until it divides the real folk from the false folk. That's what I want you to do. I want you to keep on talking to the kingdom crowd gets on one side and the non-kingdom crowd on another. That's what I want you to do. I want you to identify the perpetrators in the house. Keep on talking about the kingdom until the folk who really want what I want, the people who really are following me, identify themselves. Keep on talking until there's nothing left but a stump. Until I just have a remnant to work with. Oh, y'all don't hear me? Oh, y'all don't hear me? Don't wait for a crowd. Just keep on working until you get down to a, a stump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't
don't need a whole lot of folk to want to do God's thing. God's never used a whole lot of folk. God usually works with a remnant, a, a stump. You know what I'm saying? Just, just a, God said, no, you keep on doing things until I purify the crowd and just get down to a stump. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just tell it until I know who's really on my side. Get down to a a stop. Yeah, 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 yeah. Prophesy and don't let up until folk get sick of coming to the conference and then you'll be down to a That's what I want to work with. I'm ready to work with a Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said now from the stump that's left over after the tree is cut down, a new nation will arise. Oh. A new nation's going to come up from a stump. See, God's not going to level it down. He said, let me just have a stump left, and I'm going to cause something new to come out of a stump. I'm going to create a whole new people out of a... When you thought it was all over, all dead, all the kids done left the fellowship, that's all right. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to work with the stump. My God, it's through this faithful remnant that God's going to accomplish his work. It's through those who were left, who stood through the fire, the folks who decided they wanted to be a part of the kingdom of God, the folk who weren't doing it because it was popular. He's trying to make himself a new nation crew. That's what I'm saying, a whole new nation crew. That's what he's up to. And some of them folk are in your fellowship group. Some of those folks are in your city. Some of them folk is in this room. I want you to know as I try to conclude this thing that God is raising up what I call a reconciliation generation. I know it's right. God is raising up a reconciliation generation. And he has put it on my heart to travel coast to coast and call and commission the reconciliation generation. That's why I stopped by the Kingdom's Work Conference. I, I just came by to tell you that you're a part of a reconciliation generation. You're not Generation X. The, the folks you're working with ain't Generation X. There's not an unknown variable. Ah, the unknown variable is reconciliation. God's trying to heal his world. He's trying to put his world back together again. And he has waited until this time in history when diversity would be the highest to call forth the people from the stump that he's going to use and equip and empower to go out into the various cities and suburbs of our, of our nation and of the world. He's going to deploy you like secret agents on a mission. Oh, yeah, he is. God is about to cause the kingdom to come and he's just looking for some kingdom agents who will be a part of his reconciliation generation. He wants you to call kids to the reconciliation generation. He wants you to be a part of the reconciliation generation. He wants you to preach the kingdom, model the kingdom, talk about the kingdom, call people to the kingdom. He is looking to create a new kingdom community called the people of God who are made up of every nationality every language, every people, every ethnicity. That is the will and the purpose of God. And he's looking for some folk through whom he can work. So he's still got a question on his heart. He had a question in Isaiah and he's still got a question in not today. He said, who, 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 who shall we send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, well, it seems like a mission that's impossible, but my God, I do recall now I'm working with my Holy Ghost imagination. I, I, I do recall that in Mission Impossible there is all kinds of adventure and all kinds of suspense. It's intrigue and, and sometimes there's danger. Oh, but the Mission Impossible guy gets a special watch and oh, he gets little gadgets and he gets all kinds of stuff from Q to help him make it right. He, he gets to make it because he got all this stuff that helps him do what seems impossible. God said, I'm going to hook you up. I got some special anointing for you. Yeah, I ain't going to call you to something impossible to do. I got a power to equip you to accomplish the mission. Or oh, it might seem impossible to you, but with God, nothing.